Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you for being here for our exciting first panel of the 20, uh, 2022 Forum on Arms Trade Annual Conference. My name is Stephen Miles. I'm the president of Win Without War, and I'll be your moderator today for our discussion on alternative approaches to arms and challenging security dilemmas. In a moment, I'll introduce today's exciting panelists, but first a bit of housekeeping. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the co-sponsors for this year's conference, the Arms Control Association, the Center for Civilians in Conflict, Security Assistance Monitor at the Center for International Policy, Democracy for the Arab World Now, Dawn, and the Stimson Center. I'd also like to recognize and thank the forum's fearless leader, Jeff Abramson. I've been honored to know Jeff for a number of years, and from the first time he told me about his idea for the forum, I knew it was something vital that we desperately needed here in Washington's policy debates. I also want to take a moment to recognize that there's a lot more money going into promoting the arms sale than there is in tracking and curbing its excesses. That's a long way of saying, I hope that those of you who can support Jeff and the forum's important work are, or, and are already doing so, thank you, and for those uh, who can consider doing so. Of course, I'd like to um, take a moment now to note that our panelists will also be speaking for themselves. Um, we're hoping to have a robust and lively discussion, perhaps even a bit provocative. The forum itself does not take positions, and individual panelists may not agree on every aspect of our discussion or their policy prescriptions. But the goal of the forum is to provide a venue for sharing these ideas, thoughts, and having these important conversations. Far too often, the concerns and ideas you'll hear voiced today are absent from discussing the world's tough security dilemmas. And speaking now for myself, I think we'd all be better off if there was a whole lot more conversations like this in Washington, London, and everywhere that life and death policy decisions are being made. So with that, let's get right to the discussion. I am so pleased today to have the distinct privilege of sharing this virtual stage with three amazing leaders, Nancy O'Kale, Anna Stavrianakis, and Sarah Lee Whitson. In a moment, I'm going to ask each of the panelists uh, a first question, but before I do, I want to note that we'll be taking questions from the audience today as well. We'll be using the Q&A feature in Zoom, so if you have a question, please be sure to put it in there, and also please be sure to ask your question in the form of a question. Um, we'll also have the chat open for audience members, um, but we as panelists will not be uh, moderating that or, or keeping an eye on it, so please do put your questions in the Q&A feature. I also want to note at the end of today's panel, we'll be sharing a feedback poll that'll pop up on your screen when you exit, and we'll be following up in a few short days um, with an email with a link to the recording <clears throat> and other resources. So finally, with all of that out of the way, I'd like to ask you each to start us off for this conversation with a similar question. Today's panel is called Alternative Approaches to Arms and Challenging Security Dilemmas, which is a fancy way of saying, what other tools could we use besides arms sales and security assistance in foreign policy? As I said, I wanna ask you each to talk a little bit of first about how you see this challenge from your work, how it looks from your vantage point. In a minute, we'll then move in and get into what's working or more likely what's not working. And finally talk about what we should all do about this before moving further into Q&A. To start us off, how do you think about these issues uh, of organizations, uh, for organizations that work on arms sales and security assistance, how do you think about these issues from your perspective? I'm gonna go alphabetic here, so Nancy, uh, let me start with you and let me do a quick introduction. Um, Dr. Nancy O'Kale is the president and CEO of the Center for International Policy, and she's worked for more than two decades on issues of human rights, democracy, and security in the Middle East and North Africa. Before coming to the United States, Dr. Okeo managed to uh, manage and evaluated programs for several international organizations, including in 2012, when during her role as director of Freedom House's Egypt program, she was one of 43 NGO workers convicted and sentenced under false charges for which she was later exonerated. Nancy, over to you for our first question. Tell me how you think about these challenges of alternative approaches to the arms trade. Right. Well, First of all, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this session and for speaking alongside with Anna and Sarah's work, I respect highly. And uh, let me start right away with my view on the overall issues. I think if we look at this problem as a problem of arms sales, we'll be certainly looking in the wrong direction. This is a problem of militarization. The hyper-militarization of 
every aspect that we are seeing in our world is the core issue and framing it as such makes a huge difference in understanding how and has an implication on how we tackle those issues. Um, and I just want to start with the, the first notion of the idea of arms sales and, and, and harms and how we define it and the different mechanisms that are out there um, that we think uh, is the solution to address it. So when you think of arms sales, there's one notion that is a problem that we think when we think in, in our movement is that if only people know the impact of arms sales, which is, I think, on paper, I mean, it, it is important that people to know, but would such knowledge change things? And let me give you an example. I mean, arms are different than other forms of sales uh, and experts. If we take like a, a similar example, this is like the, the tobacco industry. And one of the, the approaches is to stop the tobacco industry is several measures and legislations. And one of them is just like putting a label on the cigarette pack that cigarettes kill. Well, you don't need that for weapons. Weapons kill. Let's be clear about that. People know that. And they are produced and manufactured for only this sole purpose. They are not... Uh, put forward or um, or sold or exported for any other reasons. And there is euphemism for everything. It's just for peacekeeping, for security, for other things. But at the end of the day, the harm is killing. And, and that's, the, that's the target. Uh, I mean, if not directly, then indirectly with, I mean, the other issues with, um, with that, uh, with weapons. Now, that brings me to the underlying assumptions that we have and, and why this is problematic when we talk about the misuse of weapons. Uh, and when you look at it this way, I mean, the misuse means like it's the, the framing of what is legitimate killing and what's not legitimate killing. And that's problematic on its own. That also has an implication if when we look at the solution for this uh, problem as a regulation issue, when we look at that is what is being harmed, like the harm inflicted within the legal framework uh, of the law and the legislations and what is not. This is highly problematic when it comes to, there are excellent, I have to say, there are excellent proposals for legislations out there. I mean, as a framework, also flipping the script is uh, one that is highly important, but looking at it without understanding the overall context and the context of the countries that we are selling arms to is important. So for example, when we say that we would stop arms sales to countries who are using it in uh, like in a different purpose than it was intended to. Example, in the Middle East, in Egypt, all the killings actually that happened in Egypt is, uh, is legal. They're killing terrorists. But the question is, who defines terrorists as terrorists? I personally have five personal friends who are in prison under terrorist charges. And that tells you so much about the absurdity of the situation and the problem of looking at the framework, the legal framework as a regulator for sort of de decreasing the harm of arms sales. I'm gonna stop here and I'm sure like we're gonna have further discussion on, on this issue. Nancy, thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited to get further into the discussion and have some follow-ups, but first I wanna turn over to you, Anna. Uh, Dr. Anna Stavrianakis is a professor of international relations at the University of Sussex, though I will note she does not speak here today for the university. Uh, she's an expert who has worked with NGOs and members of parliament to understand and attempt to improve UK and EU arms export controls. I think this is so important because often we have these conversations in the United States solely through a US lens. And so, and I'm super glad to have this international, this European perspective here. I should note last month, the World Peace Foundation published her report, Missing in Action, UK Arms Export Controls During War and Armed Conflict, which will frame some of her comments today. 
But Anna, I want to start with the same question to you. When you think about these approaches from, from your perch, from your perspective, how do you think about them? Thanks so much, Stephen, and hello, everybody. Um, the way that I frame the issue of arms exports stands really in direct contrast to that of the UK government. Uh, the UK government frames itself as having one of the most robust control regimes in the world. Um, and I basically take a, a diametrically opposed position to that. Um, but I also uh, frame the issues in contrast to the assumption of the essential benevolence of UK foreign policy more generally. Now, obviously, the government would promote that sort of uh, position, but I think that many civil society organisations also either share that view or end up perpetuating it. And I think that's kind of a problem for how we think about specific um, themes or issues such as the arms trade. So more specifically, I'm framing the issue of arms exports in the following ways. Firstly, that arms exports to states involved in war and conflict are typical of UK arms export policy. They're not the exception, they're not the aberration. They're not a mistake in an otherwise peaceful and benevolent foreign policy. Secondly, uh, I frame the issue in recognition that what we tend to see or think of as outbreaks of conflict in cases such as those that I analyze in the report, which is the wars in Kashmir, Palestine, Sri Lanka, and Yemen, these seemingly um, new or occasional outbreaks are not isolated. They are not new. They are recurrent phases of much longer ongoing violent conflicts to which Britain has historically been central as a colonial and post-colonial power. Thirdly, I think that any meaningful discussion of alternative approaches has to involve an assessment of the UK's own use of weapons in war and its own transfers to its Western and NATO friends and allies, and not just in terms of transfers to non-Western states, which is the usual focus uh, of arms trade controversies. So alternative approaches, I think, need to draw links between arms exports and other issues of international concern, be it climate emergency, be it migration and refugee policy, be it policing and surveillance, be it indebtedness and poverty, all of which are racialized, gendered and classed. And I think for those of us that, that see ourselves as members of uh, sort of the arms control or arms export control community, I think partly it's an impulse to an impetus to us to, to get out of our silos a bit more uh, and, and start making connections with people working on other issues. And also, and this is this is hard, is to, to stop perpetuating the idea that the foreign policy of our home state or our adopted state is progressive and challenge and actually starting to challenge the idea that arms sales should even be a tool of foreign policy, challenging the idea that arms export should be used as a lever to advance our national interests, whatever we think they should be. So for me, I think ultimately the question ends up being, how can I participate in holding the UK state and its allies accountable for the harms that they contribute to without recentering them in the analysis as uh, basically the countries that should be in charge of how the world runs. Thank you. So much, Anna. So much there to come back to in, in a few moments. But before we do, I want to turn to our final panelist. And last but not least, my good friend, Sarah Lee Whitson. Sarah Lee is the Executive Director of Democracy for the Arab World Now, DAWN, an organization founded by the late Jamal Khashoggi uh, that works to promote democracy and rule of law and human rights for all peoples in the Middle East and North Africa. All issues Sarah, has, Sarah Lee has been an outspoken advocate on for. Previously, she was Executive Director of Human Rights Watch's Middle East and North Africa Division for more than 15 years, overseeing the work of the division in 19 countries across the region. So, so Leah, you, you sit in a slightly different perspective. So I'm wondering, how do you think about these issues? What is, what is the framing you take and from your perspective? Uh, well, perhaps not surprisingly, I share the framing that Anna just shared in terms of uh, how uh, I see and we see, my organization sees the role of US arms exports uh, to primarily the Middle East, which is of course uh, our focus. Um, and um, the challenge uh, within the foreign policy community that continues to, uh, uh, against the facts, against the blinding facts staring at us in the face, uh, see U.S. foreign policy as an instrument of good, uh, see arms sales, arms transfers, arms assistance, 
uh, as an opportunity to use its quote unquote leverage positively um, and um, really buy into that narrative in terms of the foreign policy community's advocacy with respect to the deplorable human rights records uh, of uh, uh, governments in, in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, I think if we uh, uh, change uh, our assessment or, or uh, update our assessment to recognize um, that in fact um, the US government is fueling a, an arms race and leading probably history's greatest arms dump into a region uh, 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 ever uh, in terms of the reality that the two largest weapons purchasers uh, in the world are Saudi Arabia and the UAE, tiny UAE, uh, with a, probably a population of adult male citizens, uh, less than 500,000 people. Um, and when we recognize that all of the so-called mechanisms for conditioning uh, US military uh, transfers, arms transfers to the Middle East, have never failed, but have perpetuated this mythology that the United States is attempting to impose human rights restrictions or human rights conditions on its client states uh, as a positive uh, agent um, um, should lead us to uh, take the position um, that Don takes, which is that all weapons uh, to uh, abusive governments should end. Um, and I think it's important to frame this not as an issue of end weapons sales or weapons transfers to abusive governments so that they'll stop uh, carrying out their abuses or that we might positively influence them. No, this is about America's own human rights obligations uh, to stop contributing to abuses, to stop propping up abusive governments, um, as well as uh, compliance with US law, unenforced US law, that prohibits arms transfers to abusive governments. Um, I think we collectively uh, need to also examine why our efforts to limit arms transfers to abusive governments, uh, to provide gifts of weapons to abusive governments that do not serve our national interest, why we have failed for decades and decades. Um, and I think that requires our advocacy community uh, to look behind and challenge the structures uh, that make our advocacy, you know, relatively unimportant uh, in the face of billions and billions of dollars of profits and an incentive structure in our own country uh, between defense industry lobbyists and foreign government lobbyists uh, uh, tied to the revolving door in our government that sends government officials to look for their next paycheck from the people they're supposed to be regulating, from the industries they're supposed to be regulating. If we don't take on the issue of foreign government and defense industry lobbyists and seek to ban their access to our officials, if we don't seek to ban uh, US government officials providing services or creating quote unquote investment funds like Jared Kushner did uh, to former client governments, um, we are not going to make sufficient progress to address uh, the catastrophe of uh, the arms dump uh, to the Middle East that is literally reducing the entire region to rubble. Powerful words, Sarah Lee. Thank you. I hope you all now are seeing why we're so excited for this conversation today. Um, uh, and I think I want to come back to you next uh, to, to kick us off here. As I mentioned earlier, you recently released a report. And so as we as we transition kind of from what's the issue we're talking about today to how are our governments doing? How, how are these controls working? How, how are how are the systems functioning themselves? I'd love if you could say a little bit more about from your perspective, and I'll note, I think we all share a healthy skepticism on this panel today. Um, so, but from your perspective, what's not working? And I suppose provocatively, is there anything that is working? Thanks, Steve. And I guess the question is working for whom? Uh, and I suppose the controls perversely are working very well for industry, even though they complain about them a lot uh, and working uh, reasonably well for government to use them uh, as a means to justify. Um, so I've given you a little insight into the, the snapshot uh, of what my, my kind of headline argument is about the, the, the actual operation of policy around arms export controls in the UK. Um, so when we drill down into the detail, uh, and I demonstrate this in the cases that I examine in the report, we see that arms export 
um, licensing decisions, the civil service um, bureaucracy, um, takes a very narrow interpretation of risk. Um, they're supposed to be assessing the risk of the misuse of weapons. Um, they take a very narrow interpretation of risk, effectively operating as if neither the past nor the future actually exist. So risk assessments treat each round of violence as new, as a blank state, as disconnected from the past and disconnected from any potential future developments. Ceasefires or other de-escalations are interpreted to mean that there is now no clear risk of misuse and therefore no reason to deny arms exports, which uh, as we see in several of the cases actually allows recipients to replenish their armories for use in later assaults and later rounds of violence. When controversy is generated from civil society, from parliamentarians and so on, the government conducts fairly self-serving reviews of licensing process, but not of the actual po policy. Those reviews are mobilized to validate government policy and to facilitate increased exports rather than restrict them. It's the kind of nothing to see here sort of review. Occasionally, at a late stage, when violence escalates to extreme levels and external pressure mounts, we might see tokenistic refusals or revocations of licenses. So in practice, what we see is that on the one hand, the existence of the export controls do allow critics to draw attention to the misuse of weapons. They give them a language to use. It gives them a framework to use. It's also the, the basis of the legal challenges that we've seen in the UK from the campaign against arms trade. So the, the criteria, the export criteria, give critics a framework and a language to try to hold government to account. But on the other, and much more um, frequently and much more meaningfully, we see the criteria actually being mobilized by government in a very kind of repetitive mantra-like form to deflect criticism, to close down debate and to, to, to close down scrutiny. It might sound perverse or counterintuitive to think about controls as facilitating, legitimating or justifying arms exports, but I think those are actually the main effects of the controls. So that's in terms of the operation of policy. Two other short things to say. One is, OK, so what are the drivers? If that's how policy operates, how come? Sarah Lear has talked uh, about the, the, the influence of industry, and I think it's significant, but I don't think it's the whole story. The arms industry plays a crucial but kind of hidden from public debate kind of role in the ongoing state support for arms exports. But state support, I don't think, is reducible to industry in interests. Rather, there's a mutually supportive, entrenched, organic relationship between the two, between the state's geopolitical interests, the British state's understanding of itself as a post-imperial geopolitical power, and the interests of industry. And that generates a congruence of assumptions and interests about the benefits of arms exports. And then to think briefly about accountability. Scrutiny is a key parliamentary function and responsibility. And it can generate transparency and accountability when it works well. In the UK, we have a, a set of committees called the Committees on Arms Export Controls, who've played a politically fluctuating role in generating accountability. Occasionally, they've generated robust criticism of government policy and practice, and that's where I see that's been the one thing that kind of has worked well, and that has been done definitely with the support of the UK-based NGO community. However, its energy, its expertise, and its competence have really varied over time, um, and there's some kind of structural limitations to Parliament's ability to actually impose, to, to generate accountability from the state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, Nancy, I want to I want to come over to you. Um, you know. We've when I when I think about this question <clears throat> of what's working and what's not, um, you know, the case study of Egypt is is as you've been talking about one of the foremost. I mean, this is a, a, a massive recipient of U.S. military aid and U.S. military support, um, and we see um, cont continually some pretty horrific abuses. I'm wondering, from your perspective, both there and and more broadly in your work, you know, how is this looking for from your perspective? What's working? What's not working? Thank you, uh, Stephen. Um, so, in order to answer this question, let me let me go back to the framing. It's like why the U.S. claim uh, that it is important to continue selling arms to Egypt and the Middle East in general. 
So there are a few claims out there. Like one is to um, maintain influence and leverage. Second, in order to um, have a competitive edge over other countries, because I mean, like the, the whole argument that if we don't sell it, others will sell it to them. And third, of course, the, the framing that this is in support of democracy uh, in a very convoluted way. And finally, is basically, I mean, like that's domestically the creation of jobs. When we come to look at all these things playing out in Egypt, if we look at, for example, the competitive edge, uh, that if we don't sell it to them, others will sell it to them. Well, others are already selling it to them. And you have like the same uh, week where the U.S. on January 25th uh, sealed a deal for 2.5 billion arms sales to Egypt. Only three days later, Egypt had a deal of $1.7 billion uh, with South Korea. Uh, and just last year, the overall German experts, arms experts, have been bumped up mainly thanks to the huge four over four billion dollar deals of arms experts to Egypt. So the this is the fallacy of the idea if we don't sell it to them, they're gonna get it from others. Even when we talk about Russia and under the countering uh, America's adversarial through sanctions act, which prohibits that the US oh, so any countries receiving I mean arms from the US should not get arms from other adversaries. But that's not the only way that there is a like a military strategic relationship. It, like Russia and Egypt has been having like um, trainings and mutual exchange of information and they even framing as the friendship and strategic relationship between Russia and Egypt. In terms of influence, when it comes to arms, I don't think, I mean, I can find an example over at least the past 10 years where that has been an actually influential tool. Actually, there were, in, in my case, when I was prosecuted, when we were on trial, 17 Americans were on trial on a case that is still open until today, case 173, in the U.S. having $1.3 billion each year in military assistance to Egypt could not stop the prosecution of 17 Americans on false charges. So this is just one example, but there are so many other examples out there that shows like it is not actually used as leverage because when they come to use it, and this is the point of your power is not just by how much are you selling and exchanging with the country, your power is your ability to actually play that card. And the US has not been able to use this card because they fear that if they don't, that they will lose the seat on the table. Uh, so they are actually paradoxically bound and crippled by their own uh, agreement and system. So this is an important point to look at and understand. Now, I, I know we're still gonna talk about this later. I, I just want to talk about like what tools that are out there that are dysfunctional and why they are dysfunctional. One of them is ironically the peace deals. And it's absurd to see that like recent or even old deals of peace, like recently like the Abraham Accords, it is actually in exchange for supporting more arms. So this is like even counterintuitive when you think of it on how it affects um, the, how things move and change and is actually such peace deals are actually further perpetuating the arms uh, industry and all the, the, the incentive to that. The second thing is that when there are evaluations of the country, the particular country that we're talking about, we don't give arms to abusive uh, countries. It's very difficult and, and it is very distorted to think of one country on its own because these countries as a network, like Egypt is not operating its own, it's operating with UAE, Saudi Arabia. And just to give you an example, I mean, just a few weeks ago, um, General uh, Frank McKenzie is like the top uh, authority on the 
um, the Center of Command in the Middle East uh, announced that actually the deal for the F-15s is going to move ahead. Uh, and that this is something that he is pleased to announce. Like, who is the country that is actually behind that and, and lobbying for Egypt and urging the Biden administration to sell the F-15s to Egypt? It's Israel. So the idea is that when we frame those um, legislations and regulations and only direct them to a single country without understanding the geopolitical atmosphere and connections that are out there, we're totally missing the point. And putting our energy and resources um, behind an ineffective tool. So this is just, I can carry on later, but it's just like when I hear from Sarah and the rest. Thank you so much, Nancy. And, and I think you did tee it up very well for, for me to hand it over to Sarah Lee to talk about some of these things of, again, from this question of what's working and what's not working. And, and Sarah Lee, I'll, I'll, I'll say I, I know from our own conversations um, and the work you all have done at Dawn, um, there's a strong critique from, of conditionality that, that you have put forward um, that we're hearing parts of today. And I want to maybe invite you to, to, to pull that out a little bit more as Nancy was talking about these arguments aren't working. You know, we're not seeing the behavior modified. We're, we're seeing lots of loopholes. So maybe maybe if you want to start there and say more about uh, what's not working. And, and again, if, if you think there is anything that is working in the current approaches. Uh, yeah. So uh, in terms of conditionality, it has largely been the approach of advocacy organizations and organizations uh, focused on uh, limiting the transfer of weapons to abusive governments. Uh, for many decades now. And the argument goes something like this. Um, yes, we should, or we will, or we must transfer weapons to Egypt uh, or Israel, uh, um, or you know, sell weapons to Saudi or UAE, but let's limit a portion of that to XYZ reforms. Um, so right off the bat, um, the advocacy community is abstaining from challenging why there is any weapons going, is ceding the point that these arms transfers, whether to Israel or Egypt or arms sales uh, to Saudi and UAE countries that we focus on, serve the national interest. We, we abstain from that discussion entirely. Uh, we assume that our government officials are representing the national interest for legitimate national security interests. Uh, and on the other hand, have to face uh, human rights concerns. Um, and then we try to chip away uh, at the military transfers that uh, through that process, uh, including, for example, relying on the Leahy laws, which say, well, you may not transfer weapons to X military unit of a, a, a government that's uh, 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 found to have committed abuses pretending that the abuses committed by a particular military unit are an aberration or outside the control and plan of the central government or that money and weapons are not fungible. You can rename the unit whatever you want, uh, et cetera. Um, we buy into the fantasy that the United States is concerned about human rights in these countries uh, and may use its leverage uh, or has leverage to be used um, with these abusive governments uh, by dangling cuts in uh, 100 million out of 2 billion or one and a half billion dollars uh, in weapons vis-a-vis uh, -vis the abusive government like Egypt. Um, and we ignore the reality um, that those, even those minor cuts are never made and that no human rights reforms ever emerge. Um, and, and so we're stuck in that, accepting that parameter of conditionality as an effective tool of reform. It's not. The evidence makes that very clear. Um, it flies in the face of the overwhelming evidence that the U.S. government's top priority is weapons sales, weapons transfers, and, and as Anna was alluding to, not merely for the profit motive uh, and, and the self-interest of government officials going to defense industry and foreign government employment subsequent, but wrapped into their uh, assumed uh, uh, need to maintain American hegemony and American primacy uh, in the Middle East by being the number one weapons purchaser with the most military bases and the most troops uh, and the most 
power uh, in the region. These two things are tied together. Um, our approach in the advocacy community, looking at individual cases of arms transfers tied to particular abuses, fails to take on um, these broader macro problems that are the true obstacles for making progress in the transfer of arms uh, uh, to uh, abusive governments on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it's not too dissimilar from uh, uh, advocacy organizations that examine the impact of the, uh, the unlawfulness of particular strikes and particular use of weapons, um, but never take on the war-making machinery uh, of uh, the U.S., uh, uh, which in fact is in, in some ways now being reduced to mercenary machinery, as for example, the UAE and Saudi Arabia are demanding uh, that the US sign written uh, defense treaties with them in exchange for an agreement uh, by them to say, increase oil output. Um, if that doesn't strike folks as mercenary, then, then I really don't know what does. Charlie, let me stick with you for a moment and, and transition us into, because I think it's such a, an, a powerful, you know, denunciation of kind of what's going wrong. Um, but obviously the, the name of our panel today here is Alternatives. Um, and, and how could we structure this differently? So let me, let me put the question back to you. If conditionality, this, this idea that existed for a long time in the civil society space that we should say, okay, we're only going to give you these if, if you do X, Y, and Z, if that doesn't work as, as, as you've laid out, if, if, if we have it, if we're seeing the outcomes that, that are problematic in, across so many case studies, what are, what are alternatives? What can we do differently? What should we be advocating for? Well, I think, again, starting, I think we have to shift our frame of obligation and responsibility. Um, the obligation and the responsibility of the U.S. government is not to transfer weapons to reckless, abusive, uh, apartheid governments in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, th those same criteria may be met by other governments around the world, but the Middle East is the number one dumping ground uh, of American weapons, uh, putting Ukraine uh, aside for the moment. Um, and so the obligation of the United States is to stop doing that, and we should be looking to uh, uh, reinvigorate existing laws like Section 502B that prohibits arms transfers to abusive governments. Uh, I think we should get out of the piecemeal game uh, of, say, of, of, of demanding or, or supporting efforts to limit some portion, some minuscule portion of, of, of military assistance uh, based on so-called human rights conditions um, because it is a, a futile task. It uses up all our energy, all our resources, all our attention without getting to the core of the problem that the U.S. is violating its own laws and its own human rights responsibilities by transferring even one penny uh, of weaponry. We should be part of the discussion about re-examining why the United States needs to continue uh, to be the number one weapons provider, the number one hegemon, the number one in military bases, the number one in troops, the number one in conflicts uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, and we need to think about how the United States can reimagine itself as a leader in peace, as a leader in trade, as a leader in economy, as a leader in education, technology, knowledge, all of the things um, that should be constructive to the planet, not destructive to the planet. Um, and we need to take on our adversaries. We need to take on the people who want to see all of our efforts fail. And that is the defense industry lobbyists, and that is the foreign government lobbyists. Um, we have to take on the corruption of our own government as part of our arms control work. We have to fight to prohibit access of lobbyists to our government officials, and we have to fight to prohibit our government officials going to work for lobbyists and foreign governments after their service is done. Um, we, we, it's not a fair fight. It's not a fight of ideas. It's not a fight of principles. It's not a fight of laws uh, when we are challenged by the systemic corruption of our government uh, through campaign finance rules and revolving doors. That has to be part of our mandate. 
Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm going to come to you in a little bit to talk about corruption, because um, I, I, Saralia just brought that in the conversation again, and, and you spoke eloquently about that earlier. But Nancy, first, I want to come to you. Um, you know, you, you said earlier, I wrote it down, um, you know, weapons kill. That's their purpose, right? Um, but I, I am I am struck as somebody who's who's involved in many of these fights that our opponent's argument is always that they bring security, that they 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 don't they they help you know they help governments put down um, you know civil unrest and and they help bring security. So I want to to invite you to think about this question of alternatives and and I think we've well established the skepticism we all have for whether or not these weapons actually do that. But but build on that in, in terms of what could actually be done to address not just bringing security, but the other the other arguments you talked about, jobs arguments, um, you know, the the fact that that we, we're in this economic competition. What can we do? What should we do about about the the lessons we're talking about today? Sure, and and let me just like uh, pick up from like the the last like very eloquent points that Sarah made about the U.S. being number one and everything. And the issue starts with under, like equating the US being the number one in military power, that it is num the most powerful uh, country. That's not the case. And equating being the, 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 the increased military production or number one in military production is the most secure, Equ equating uh, military might with security. And, and that's why, like when I started at the beginning, that we should not see this as an issue of just arms trade and arms control. This is an issue of hyper militarization. Um, and that has an implication, again, like on all the things that we are looking at in terms of possible uh, solutions uh, or ways to address this. And I just want to, uh, again, related to everything that Sarah said, related to the industrial military complex, the revolving door issue, uh, the lack of independence out there because of the power of lobbyists. These are all important issues because this is what we should be looking at is the enabling environment that is allowing this to continue to happen. Now, when we try to look at this with um, improving and introducing more regulations, we have to be very careful, particularly for all the points that Sarah made. And it's just like one of my favorite um, procedural legitimacy sociologists give this uh, very, um, very clear analogy. And it's interesting, it's a bit simplistic, but it would say like, a hospital will not lose its license if they exercise exorcism on a patient and it gets better. Uh, but it would lose its license. Sorry, it, it would lose its license if that happens. But it would not lose its license if it follows the right procedures, even if the patient dies. So if we focus on procedural legitimacy, it's highly problematic. It may be even legitimizing and, and promoting the continuation of the trends that we are seeing right now. And in order to reverse that, we have to take a few things at least into consideration. That regulations alone would not solve the problems. And before introducing new regulations, we have to ask an important question is like, why are the existing one are not working? Why are Leahy laws and other tools and mechanisms for accountability are not working and how can we make them work before we put our energies onto, onto new ones. So third, I mean, it is very important to not look into this issue in isolation from everything else that is happening in isolation from corruption and isolation from climate change. And just to give you an example, like the, the direct relationship of, of that, the seven top countries that contribute to 48% of the, um, the fossil fuel and, and carbon emissions in the world had made pledges for climate finance. Now, those countries between, uh, I think it was uh, 2013 and 2018, uh, have, in, have just invested double the, the amount of money that is supposed to go to that in border control. So over this period of time, they have invested $33 billion on militarizing borders 
and as opposed to $14 billion for climate finance. Now, the border control is actually to stop the people who are fleeing this, the countries that are affected by climate change. So the solution for everything becoming militarization uh, is, uh, is an issue that we should look at broadly than just looking at, at arms uh, control. That's one thing. Now, when it comes to advocacy, and I think framing is very important. Again, going back to the idea of the theory behind if only people knew, if only people knew that these atrocities are happening, they're going to change their mind. Not necessarily. It is, it is an important but not sufficient condition for change. People don't change their minds because they get aware of a problem. People change their minds on two cases. One, when they are subject to a crisis or they find that their interest in an opposite direction of what is happening. So for example, like simple things like highlighting the, the fallacy of the whole thing about the investment in the manufacturing uh, of weapons industry produces jobs. I mean, just to give you a, like a, a small uh, number to put things into perspective, a $1 billion in military spending creates 11,200 as opposed to 26,000 in education, 16,800 in energy and 17,200 in healthcare. So this is just like one to drop down the fallacy. But what I'm saying right now still falls into that if only people know. And here is the point that is very important when we think about advocacy, when we think about our framing, we cannot separate foreign policy from domestic policy and making that link. Why should people care about issues that we are framing as foreign policy? First of all, I mean, there's a huge problem that we see that militarization is the, not part of the foreign policy, it is the main foreign policy tool of the US and that should change. But also what should change is that this is a matter of not just something about international affairs that is happening out there in countries in African Middle East. And now it's like, oh, it's coming close to Europe, uh, is that we should link it to what benefits that would make, not just the harm. What would people win out of having such investment being diverted into a domestic issue. And, and this is an important message. The final thing that I want to say that we cannot fight the issue of um, the expansion of arms trade from a unilateral perspective, because if we don't conduct this approach in collaboration with Europe, because we cannot just like stop a, the sales from the side of the US, and as I just gave the numbers and examples at the beginning, is like the Europeans are continuing to make those sales. So this has to be an international effort uh, with a way that is binding, that does not lead the way that one country would stop the sales and that means the surge from, from the other side. So just like to sum up all this, I mean, the focus on regulations alone would not um, actually lead to a better situation. The focus on looking, raising the awareness of the harms of weapons is not particularly effective in changing people's minds and directions. Working on the US alone will not solve the problem. Thank you so much, Nancy. I'm so glad you ended there because it's a perfect pivot to hop across the pond to Anna. And, and Anna, I, I will say, I remember myself working in a previous role for an international global campaigning organization, working on, at the time, Canadian and British arms sales to Saudi Arabia about the UAE. You know, it, it's, it's a game of whack-a-mole, you know, it, it, it is, it is, you know, it is, well, if we don't do it, the Canadians will, the Canadians say, if we don't do it, the British will, if we don't do it, the Germans will, if we don't do it, the Americans will. Um, and they're not wrong, um, right? They're, they're not wrong. These, these, these weapon systems, particularly within NATO, NATO allies, and Western countries are, you know, they, they do just pop the manufacturing around. So it is important to talk about this internationally. It is important to talk about this from a non um, simply US framework. And so I'd love to bring in this question of what do we do about this? Where do we go from here um, to you and to get your perspective? Sure. It, I find it quite difficult to make recommendations. Uh, with the World Peace Foundation report, obviously any policy-oriented report needs to have a recommendation section. Um, 
but it's hard to make recommendations on the good faith assumption that the problem is lack of information or lack of understanding that oh now that everyone's read my report they're gonna like stop selling weapons to saudi arabia because they just didn't know that before but like, that's just not how policy operates the problem isn't lack of information or lack of expertise or lack of recommendation but the low resonance of arms trade issues uh, and a lack of political will um, having said that i will make two recommendations which one of which um, i think is is unlikely at the moment but something that ha that has potential and the other speaks um, quite directly to what nancy was just saying so the first is um, an avenue um, so giving up on the idea of being able to um, persuade or embarrass what seems like an unembarrassable conservative government in the uk at the moment to give up trying to change their policy sort of through persuasion or embarrassment think instead about accountability so uh, avenues via the, 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 the via parliament um, to basically transform the committees on arms export controls um, from their current status as what's called a super committee, which is basically they're made up of um, four, four um, separate committees who each send representatives to talk about arms exports and to turn that into a standing select committee on arms exports. Because that would remedy, and this is, is kind of boring and kind of technical, but actually deeply, deeply political and, and is probably the one thing that might help us um, sort of shift accountability back onto to, to track to, to try and um, um, be able to scrutinise government policy more effectively. Um, if the committees were made into a full standing um, select committee, it would mean things like they'd have their own staff, they'd have a dedicated paid chair. They'd have the resources that they need to be able to hold governments to account, because at the moment, the, the committees on arms export controls are always one of the last to get re-established after a, after a general election. There's a lot of jockeying around, like, who's going to be in it? No one really massively wants to be in it. Who's going to be the chair? All of this kind of stuff. And for those of us who's been working on this for more than five years, you're like, oh, here we go again. You start at the beginning every single time. But if you turn them into a standing committee, you then have dedicated staff. You have clerks who know their, who, you know, know their business. You have um, specialists who, who know the issues and so on. Um, it wouldn't stop the, the controversial arms exports, but it might improve the scrutiny and the accountability afterwards. The second, second recommendation I have speaks um, to what Nancy was saying about the, sort of the fallacy of if, of if only people knew. And it speaks more directly to this political problem that we have around the low salience of arms exports. As this thing over there that happens to foreigners and in Britain, there's a very kind of racialized, racist, um, uh, low resonance of arms exports. Witness the difference in, in responses to the war in Ukraine compared to the war in Yemen. We should absolutely be sending more weapons to Ukraine because we really care about the refugees from Ukraine. We don't uh, about to use an expletive, we don't really care about uh, uh, the people who are dying in the war in Yemen. I mean, the contrast is, is, is unmissable. So there is this low salience, except in particular contexts of, of arms exports. Um, and so I think for those of us working sort of in, in, in expert driven organisations, we, we tend to operate with a strategy of correcting misinformation. We, our organizations and I as an academic, I'm like, well, if only people knew they would learn, then if they learned, they would do something differently. It's not the case. We need to, we do need to, misinformation needs to be corrected, but we also need to place greater emphasis, emphasis on things like recruiting trusted community figures who can challenge dominant narratives around arms exports. The problem isn't a lack of information or a lack of expertise, but the low resonance of the issue. So who is the messenger? So in the UK, the question would be, who is the right person to be the messenger about the fallacies of the, arm, the, the economic benefits of arms exports? Who are the people who can bring the messages actually the, that the lives of the people in Yemen ought to be worth as much as the lives of, 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 of people in Britain, who themselves are not only white? You know, when you talk about answers, you think Britain was a solely white country. There are so many communities that are written out of the response to arms exports. So we need to start thinking, I think, as organisations and as activists and as organisers towards thinking about 
who who are the messengers whose voices can be heard on this issue? Because our voices as experts are not being heard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And when when we're talking about the the horrific reality of, of Yemen and the fact that it continues to be ignored, I don't think you need to apologize for using for almost using an expletive. I think, in fact, the use of expletives is almost demanded uh, in the in the discussion of some of these topics. So, I want to thank everybody for uh, putting questions and answers. Um, in the Q&A section. If you still have one and, and you haven't put it there, um, please do. We're going to open this up a little bit now and start getting to some of these questions. We have already talked to, uh, to some of these questions, and so thank you to those to those of you who put them in. I want to start um, by, by talking a little bit broader than even the U.S. and, 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 and the U.K. Um, and bring in the United Nations, bring in the arms trade treaty, um, and talk about the role of potentially multilateral institutions here, the role of how we how we talk about these things in those forum, in those institutions. What what does that have to play in this con in this construct? What role does that have to play? What more is there that we could be doing with those? Or is that simply attempting to do an, another regulatory structure um, at a multilateral level and at a national level with the same failure likely um, to, to, to follow. So I'm going to open it up there um, for anyone who wants to jump in. Um, just take yourselves on mute, off mute and, and jump right in. I can start if you like. I mean, as someone who is um, has long been skeptical actually about the ability of the ATT to serve its stated purpose and also as someone who is now very interested in all the legal cases that are being brought off the back of the ATT uh, which means that it is working but in a different way to what it says on the tin. In terms of thinking about how we might connect up um, the arms trades to kind of deeper issues of power in the international system and reform of the UN system, what I would do would be to pay attention to the experiences of smaller states. So if you, if you look at how, for example, the CARICOM states engaged with and negotiated at the UN for the arms trade treaty, um, they were combining both uh, issue expertise from the, from the sort of perspective of those um, on the receiving end um, of, of unregulated and poorly regulated arms transfers. But they also combined that with some really savvy um, maneuvering about how to, to leverage themselves in a system that is formally equal, right? That all of those states are formally equal to all others that are there. But they don't have money to all send a diplomat to Geneva or to New York. So they had to um, they had to pool their resources and they would basically work together as a group and send 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 one person or send two people. So this idea of kind of punching above their weight. And I think if we were if I, again, who is this we if the UN system was serious um, about uh, uh, um, addressing power inequalities that go to the heart of the negotiation of any issue, be it the arms trade treaty or, or anything else, paying attention to the experience of, of, of smaller and less well-resourced um, states would be where I would start. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for starting there, because I think that brings in another question from, from the Q&A um, about what do we owe one another? What do those of us uh, who are here today in arms producing states our politicians are reaping the benefits as we've talked about. It's our corporations making the billions of dollars in profit. What are our obligations to those countries and, and those peoples who are on the receiving end of, of these weapons? As, as Sara Lee may, maybe put you on the spot, you've talked about the US flooding the Middle East with these weapons, you know, putting, putting endless amounts in there. What are our obligations that come with that? How should we think about that as civil society in predominantly the countries who are doing the supplying of the weapons? Um, well, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, impacted communities, one of Dawn's recommendations to uh, uh, advocacy organizations, academic institutions, uh, media coverage of issues pertaining to arms trade and arms transfers is to uh, be inclusive and include the perspectives of people from the impacted communities 
uh, to ask them what they want. Do they want more weapons flooding into their countries? Uh, do they want more weapons going to Saudi Arabia? Uh, what do they see as the impact of US military assistance uh, to Egypt or Israel? Um, and uh, uh, to make that part of the conversation, I mean, that's something that we at Dawn are, are, uh, are trying to do, um, but we all need to do that. And we need to make sure that when we talk about US foreign policy, it's not just Americans who talk about US foreign policy. Uh, in fact, um, it is Yemen policy and it is uh, Palestine policy and it is Egypt policy. And given that the United States is the hegemon, um, all of these people she should have a seat at the table, uh, should have a seat at our table uh, to help us understand um, what, what these uh, uh, impacts mean. Um, and then just relating back uh, to some of the comments that, that Anna and Nancy um, were alluding to in terms of the disconnect uh, between so-called foreign policy in which arms transfers falls under, um, which is, for certain, um, the least democratic, most exclusive, most elitist uh, policy circle sphere um, that is nearly entirely absent from uh, popular discussion, uh, prioritization, uh, concern, activism on local levels. Um, is we need to do a better job of connecting the dots, connecting the dots of a highly racialized uh, arms policy, a highly racialized foreign policy, a highly racialized sanctions policy, which is, of course, uh, a means of warfare uh, by other means um, that is disproportionately, not just disproportionately, almost entirely, almost 100% uh, impacting black and brown people uh, around the world. And for us to help uh, uh, students and activists uh, who, are, who are present on domestic issues uh, from racialized policing, uh, from mass incarceration, uh, 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 from, from, from all of the uh, uh, symptoms of, of racism in our society to see our foreign policy, our militarization, our, our hegemonistic militarized approach to conflict uh, in uh, uh, the Middle East in particular as part and parcel of the same problems and part and parcel of the worldview and approach of the same decision makers. Um, I think that might uh, uh, help us uh, expand a connection to these issues such that people feel that it is part of their own real world day-to-day -day concern uh, and not just as, as, as one of the speakers said, something that's happening to people far away over there. Thank you, and 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 I want to I want to in part answer one of the questions as well uh, that that's in the chat about kind of which countries is this happening in, or, or weapons kind of leaking out of the pipeline, if you will, or ending up um, in quote unquote terrorist hands, um, and and reiterate kind of something Sarah Sarah Lee was just saying. It's everywhere, you know, whether these weapons are being used by the governments that they're given to to terrorize their own citizens, or as we see time and time again, as Anna was talking about earlier. These weapons don't simply go away when conflicts end, when, when moments happen. I, I, I can't recount the times I've seen the United States blowing up you know, weaponry that we gave to some country because it's now in someone else's hands. And that's before you even begin to talk about secondary markets like we've seen in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere where these weapons find their way into, in, into the streets and into marketplaces. And so it's really a tremendous problem. And, and I think, Sarah I, I wanna pull out something you said about the willingness to just look the other way, to dismiss it through uh, racism, through Orientalism, through colonialist mindsets is, is omnipresent in our debates. And I think something, something we really have to confront. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna pivot here a little bit. And, and Nancy, I wanna go to you. Um, and, and I wanna talk about, I wanna, I wanna pull in one of the questions about how much is all of this connected into the, the US global war on terror, the kind of post 9-11 wars. Um, because I do think you raised a good point about what we're seeing with both the arms transfers and the security assistance that we've given to Egypt and the role that, that terrorism, quote unquote, terrorism plays in how they're used and how they're implemented um, in Egypt. And so do you want to maybe say a bit more about that connection between the past two decades of, of post 9-11 wars in the U.S. and the, and the impact that's having um, on the ground? Yes. Um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, 
What I'm going to say is actually very much, again, related to what Anna and Sarah were saying, is the understanding of the connections between all the different direct and indirect impact of the use of arms. Uh, And when you come to the issue of terrorism, one of the problem is that we, the people who are the authority of saying what's happening in the Middle East, for example, in, in terrorism, are the least transparent people. And first of all, the information, and I'm, and I'm going to go back and say, is like, if only people know, it's not a problem, but it is important for people to understand to what end. The, all the arms that are being transferred to the region in the name of fighting terrorism is actually not just that it's not falling into the hands of the, the right people, if we can like even define something like that, but also are they affected? Because, I mean, just like given an example from the work we did at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, the Egypt Security Watch, that is showing that at the height of the time that Egypt under President Sisi was launching the whole war and terror, uh, particularly in 2014, the number of terror attacks tripled in their like number in terms of like if they were like 30 attacks per month going up to 90 attacks per month after they started the launch on the whole the um the terror uh, the terror war or the war in terror similarly also one thing it is important to understand and that goes back to I want to focus on the point of the issue of misuse of arms of what how many countries where we see that the arms are transferred to that's not the only problem they actually, there is an imaginary uh, static idea about the impact of arms that is just about killing people. But we are looking at after 20 years in Afghanistan, what we are seeing now is not just about the immediate killing, but we're seeing starvation uh, over there. We are seeing more reasons that actually would encourage more people and more recruitment into. Um, Terror, um, terror operations or or even terror regimes, I mean, as uh, if we may put it that way. Now, I think it is important also when we look at this issue, we look at something different than the kinetic um, weapons, because these things will be far more complicated when we look at cyber warfare and cyber weapons. And the questions that we are asking ourselves and the assumptions that we are making about those weapons and conventional weapons are going to be challenged um, fundamentally when we think about is like when you sell cyber weapons and cyber warfare, how can you say that this is not being used by uh, the right people to the right uh, direction. That's why it goes back to my earlier point about regulation, because regulation assumes it's regulating states. But the more we go into other forms of weapons, like the, again, like looking at the cyber warfare, non-state actors play a much bigger role than governments. So that brings me again to the point of what should we do about this? And I think one important point, like two important points in terms of the narrative and in terms of the framing of the regulation. The impact and the accountability uh, for the atrocities that happens with those weapons should be somehow linked to the manufacturers of those weapons and not just go through the broken link that it is the policy world and this is the, the government and we should punish the government. No, it has to hurt and we should raise the raise the cost of oppression. We should raise the cost of injustice and causing grievances. This is when it will hurt the most. And this is the only, I mean, I think a very critical way to connect that to their profits, connect that to actually their whole industrial complex. The other related issue is, I mean, a lot of people now are starting to look not just as the military industrial complex, but the military industrial congressional media complex. And that's very important. And it goes back to the 
point that Anna was saying is just like, if only people would read our reports and we do our best. And, and again, like it's a necessary but not sufficient condition because the people who read our work are not particularly the people we don't want the, the, this information to reach. The way of storytelling and the medium of our app is, should change. Like right now, just a lot of information on the war in Ukraine is primarily on TikTok. This is what people see. We need to revisit our tools, the policy briefs and, and the fact sheets and the numbers are important, but there should be a medium and a way to translate though, to bridge that gap to the people in a way, in a framing that they understand. Because on the other hand, as opposed to that, you feel you see that the amount of money that is being poured over mainstream media to serve particular um, uh, uh, purposes is just unimaginable, and that shapes also the the conscious and, and socialization and understanding of the people who vote people into Congress. I mean, just like just the other days, like uh, I think it was in the Quincy Institute, just like showing that the media coverage of the war in Ukraine is far more multiple times than the coverage of the war in Iraq. And you imagine the impact of that. And that's not an, an argument whether to send arms to Ukraine or not. That this is just an argument on our research and our um, scientific methodologies in bringing out rigorous objective research is not enough to actually show the multiple and multidimensional impact of the arms. Because again, like just reading from the question that is coming on what other countries that we see the arms are being proliferated. It is not just about where physically the arms move. It is about the impact of such violence and militarization, the starvation that happens post-war and in other places. And like people are actually starting to feel the impact of the war in the invasion of Russia to Ukraine on the prices of wheat and agriculture. This is not about moving, part and, and this is why it also brings me back, I'm sorry, and just last one point about focusing on the end user certification. End user certification is very important, and it is terrible, actually, that it's not being followed. But end user certification does not isolate or contain the issue in uh, targeting just particular people or, or the right use of the arms, because the impact of that goes way beyond the actual immediate effect of, of a weapon. Thank you so much, Nancy. I want to I want to maybe use this to 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 pull in one other one other impact that that was in the form of a question. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this to to all of you, and also invite you to to address to, to kind of make this closing comments and 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 you know add anything uh, you you want to say as a kind of final takeaway here. And and we'll go around um, uh, in, in a moment before we close. Um, but one of the one of the impacts of all these weapons is, of course, tremendous carbon pollution for many of the weapon systems, um, and just the opportunity cost that Nancy, you talked earlier about about what we're not doing as global governments, as global society, to confront climate crisis. And so, I'd love if if you all wanted to take a moment to talk about the intersections of the arms trade of these arms industry issues with climate change. Um, what are we not doing because we're focused on these arms issues? Is there a direct linkage? Um, are they just two separate things and we need to be able to, to, to do both things at once? Um, how do you see these issues interconnecting? Um, and what role, um, if any, do we know of that the arms trade and these, these arms shipments uh, and arms weapons, arms systems in general are, are playing in uh, fueling the climate crisis? I can call on you, but if anybody feels motivated to jump uh, at that first, just uh, Anna. Okay, Anna, go for it. I can do that. Um, I think this is a really good question to to, to wrap up on. Um, and when you say, Stephen, you know, sort of when you ask, what are we not doing because we're too focused on arms issues, makes me think that we, and I include myself in this, we need to do a better job of asking ourselves, well, what sort of issue is the arms trade. What are arms trade issues? We've tended to think about them as exports to repressive regimes, 
with and we've spent you know the last hour or so discussing how that's a very limited framework i think if we move towards thinking uh, as nancy has been talking about in, to a, a militarism frame we can start thinking about if we think about arms production and arms exports as just one component of militarization and of militarism which itself is bound up with extractivism and of um, um, and climate change and the creation of the climate emergency, we can see actually that arms exports are a climate emergency issue. Uh, and that also domestic procurement and our own military's use of fuels, our own military's use of weapons are themselves um, environmental issues. It gives us a much, um, I think it gives us a much more productive um, lens for thinking about the political significance and the meaning um, of arms production and arms exports. One of the things that heartened me when sort of observing the through the media, the, the, the COP26 in Glasgow was the much more kind of publicly visible connections that are being made between um, sort of mainstream environmentalism and militarism or anti-militarism. Um, so I think that that is heartening that it's, you know, it's not just about you know my individual choice about whether I'm going to fly or eat meat or use a plastic straw. But it's also what's my government doing in terms of military spending and carbon footprints of the military when the UK military has a carbon footprint bigger than something like the next 16 biggest countries combined. Um, if you want to check that figure, it's the Scientists for Global Responsibility, who are probably the leading UK based organization on that. Um, and then as someone who's got an interest in the legitimation and justifications um, that go on with uh, when governments sign up to, to regimes, uh, one of the things I've got a brilliant PhD student coming to work with me at Sussex um, from September is, is, is looking at the ways in which the British military has itself been signing up to environmentally sustainable ways of being a military. And so taking the idea of greenwashing, but extending it even further to say, let's be careful now. Let's not celebrate too quickly when our militaries start talking about being environmentally sustainable. Um, we need to be very sceptical about the way that states that claim to be liberal democracies use these justifications around being a progressive international actor. So it's a, a call to sort of keep those antennae going. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, Nancy, Sarah Lee, what's going next? Early, maybe? Uh, yeah. Um, I, oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure. Sorry, if you um, yeah, I mean, just piggybacking again off what Anna uh, said, I mean, uh, I'm very wary of imposing uh, uh, environmental or climate change demands on the military industry because uh, a la cartoons we've all seen, it will be a, a, an F-15 bomber with a BLM and LGBTQ a pride flag plastered on it. And, um, you know, I don't need a Gaia symbol uh, on top of that as well. Um, corporations have proven themselves incredibly adept at um, uh, processing these public agitations for reform and change. Uh, uh, to represent it as if it's part of their DNA, um, and so I would, I, I'm, I'm very wary of of, of going down um, that route. Um, but I did want to take a, a a moment, and I saw this in the comments, and it's not the specific question you asked me to just harken uh, uh, back to Ukraine. Um, and one of the dilemmas that we haven't talked about that I see is how you know all of our work on arms control, limiting arms transfers. Uh, the harms of weaponry, the harms of weapon expansion, dumping, they seem to have flown out the window uh, in, in terms of the Ukraine conflict, where the media in particular, the American media, I, I don't know as much about the rest of the media uh, in, 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 in Europe or in the UK, uh, are falling over themselves to champion and cheer weapons transfers to Ukraine and the war in Ukraine. And the only solution that is widely being uh, latched onto and promoted even by supposed liberals or Democrats or progressives who finally have their chance to be hawks is do everything uh, to support Ukraine and even jumping on the bandwagon of if you haven't imposed a no-fly zone, you haven't done enough, shame on you, US. Um, and you know, it's it's practically forbidden to raise questions or challenge that narrative um, to 
you know, ask about whether or not we are contributing to turning Ukraine into rubble. Uh, and, and, you know, a month or two ago, Stephen, you remember we were talking about this, uh, to even ask about what we're going to do in anticipation of this war, uh, many of us were caught off guard that it quote unquote actually happened when again, all of the incentive structures that we've seen make the answer that it's going to be a long war obvious. Uh, and, and, and now to even suggest that uh, it, full on warfare uh, 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 and that we might see the Syrianization of Ukraine it's not even permitted in the public debate, even in progressive circles, because somehow that that implies uh, 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 acquiescing to Putin and his brutality and, and uh, uh, aims for for domination and so forth. Um, but I wonder, you know, why we are not using this as an opportunity to try to raise some of these questions, even when they're a really difficult time to raise them, um, uh, because. You know, look at what happened to the Pentagon budget in the wake of Ukraine. Look at what's happened to defense spending. Look at what's happened to round after round after round of emergency legislation of you know, unbelievable quantities of, 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 of military weaponry to uh, Ukraine right now. Uh, where are those weapons going to go? What's going to happen to weapons? If Ukrainians used every last weapon that we've given to them, um, what would the outcome be? Um, and, you know, I, I hope that, that folks can start addressing uh, these questions as unpopular as they may be right now. Sarah Leah, uh, Nancy, I'm going to give you the last word here. You can, you can talk about any of the issues that have come up or, or just, just uh, bring us home. Sure. I mean, I, I, I just want to take in the key from what Sarah just said, like, even if we, when we're looking right now at what's happening in Ukraine, and as my earlier point about the coverage of mainstream media on the focus on Ukraine, so it's not just a focus, it goes back again to the framing in the narrative, because in the US media, this is not framed as a supportive way to help Ukrainian find true wars. No, it's the US and the West and the democratic world against the evil world. And when you frame it that way, and when you oppose it, then you're opposing democracy, you are opposing freedom. And there is no space for nuance, actually, to question to what end. Um, and and what is what we getting? I mean, I mean, put aside the whole hypocrisy about the US talking about this while providing uh, bombs to Saudi Arabia, bom bombing Yemen and, and all this, let alone that um, Boris Johnson visited Saudi Arabia just a day before they executed 81 people in one day. Uh, but that's not news. I mean, like people will not change their mind because politicians are hypocritical. Mm -hmm. Surprise. No, that I think what will change is actually, again, connect the responsibility to those who are profiting from this war, from not just this war, from the transfer of arms. And that brings me back to the issue of the environment and climate change. Again, there are two way connection there is that not only that hyper militarization is contributing to uh, worse conditions in terms of climate change, but at the same time, it fuels the conflicts that erupts from climate change. If you look at most of the protests that happened in the Middle East, at least in, um, in last summer, it was mostly uh, overwhelmingly about water. It was the water protest in Iran, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in, in everywhere, and most of the looming uh, wars that on uh, on the horizon are actually also about war. Now, what do you do about that? Instead of putting more money into um, into climate finance and supporting that, you put you double your money into border control and pour more arms into the same year. So your cause of a climate issue that causes drought and I mean, again, let alone like the whole impact on agricultural land and the movement of people. And then you close the borders and you pour arms into them. So this is like, the, that's why 
I was saying at the beginning, first, we kind of look at this as an arms control problem or an arms sales problem. It is a militarization problem. And we kind of look at it in separation from climate change and corruption. And I'm, and I'm glad that the coming session actually on uh, in the conference is going to address this issue. This has been such a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much, Nancy, for, for, for ending there. I, I said earlier, I think that we need to have more conversations like this. We need to ask the hard questions um, that, you're, that you're talking about, Sarah Leah. We need to talk about these issues um, internationally with, with partners, not just across the pond, but all over the world. Um, and so I wanna thank all of our panelists today for this tremendous conversation. I could go on for hours. I, I could talk to the three of you forever, but I did promise Jeff that I'd try to get us uh, to the end on schedule. And I know I need to get Anna to another meeting in a few minutes. So we're gonna close here. I wanna thank uh, our, each of our panelists again uh, to, for taking the time to share their insights with us today. I wanna give a big thank you to Jeff um, for pulling this whole conference together and for everything he does at the Forum on Arms Trade. As I said earlier, uh, shortly after this ends, you'll be prompted to complete a very quick survey that should pop up when you exit the video. Your feedback is really essential to help us improve programming moving forward. As a reminder, you'll also receive an email in the coming days with resources, a link to today's panel, uh, and, and some notes on recommendations from the conference. One final thing um, I want to note, this is the first, I believe there are two more exciting pa uh, panels as part of this year's annual conference on April 14th and April 20th. Please go to forumarmstrade.org for all of the details and links to register. On that website, you'll also find a list of the conference's co-sponsors, uh, and I'd like to once again thank them for their support. And of course, a huge thank you to all of you for joining us today, for everything you do to help build a better tomorrow. And on behalf of all the panelists, I just wanna say thank you and have a great day.